We are Chris and Abby, and welcome to our travels. Can I break on the corners? No, fuck it. We are two normal people laughing our way through life and trying to have as much fun as we can <laughs> <laughs> on the way. <laughs> you always say it looks like you're dying. <laughs> Like the car instead of the pizza. You look like fucking pizza before. Chris Alderson reporting on CBC News. CBC. Today we're in Dover, where we actually found quite a few interesting things to do, which we didn't expect at all. We visit a fort we didn't even know existed, and also a recently uncovered World War II bunker. Come into my secret tunnel. <laughs> Do you know what? I wouldn't like to be a bricklayer. <laughs> Building this. Look at all them bricks. What way do you want to go? This way. Can we get in it? What exactly is it? A fort? Can you get on top of it? How the hell did they build that? They were men back then, darling. What you saying? light work. That's, that's ev goes everywhere. What's up there? Holy moly. That's massive, isn't it? God almighty. They're pulling it off already, look. Yeah. <laughs> that's a shame that you can't get in there, though, isn't it? That's a lot of brick laying, isn't it? There's absolutely no way in, is there? No. So where's the ma where'd, where would be the main door to it? Huh? It must be from the top. It must be like a bridge. Whoa. <laughs> Getting windy. <laughs> Bloody hell. Would that come up there, do you reckon? What the hell? <gasps> There's all bits down here, let's have a look. You what? Let's have a look. Come on then. Don't know, I better take my hands out my pockets. Yep. How much do you love this camera? Because I'm going to fall. Who is us to get in? There's more going more under in. there. Well, we ain't getting under there, are we? No. Oh. Turn it like Tai Chi master when you slip. Hoi! Hoi! I do. What, you're telling me this place only had one door in? Never. He must have gone in and under. Under, maybe? Yeah. Under. Well, surely there's not tunnels and that all through inside, is there? What's that up there? Yeah, an entrance. Tunnel in there. So that's exactly what it is. A network of fortifications defending Dover. So is that the bit that we just come out of? No, that's the... You're here. Oh, so what's that's that? that bridge bit what then dropped over, look. That would have said that, look, drop red. So, if we're there, where's that? That side. Fucking hell, I'm hot now. That's like freezing cold, zip it up to your neck. Pissing down, I've been stung, fucking hell. And then you're sweating, you out run zip. That was about six swear words in that one sentence. <laughs> Sorry. Fucking hell, I'm hot. I've been fucking stung. Oh, now God. it's pissing down. down. <laughs> I, I was telling you something, and then I got, I got stung. What's this? How much, do you bet, how much do you bet you can't go down it? Now it's blocked off, look. Is it? Yeah. Let's have a look. You want to do it? Why, why is this here? Huh? We'll have to have a look at the information board because I've got no idea why this is here. <laughs> Would this not be the underneath to all of that? I don't know. No, I don't. We just don't build stuff like this anymore, do we? Why don't we build stuff like this anymore? Things just ain't great anymore, are they? I mean, look, this fence. 
Whoa, you can go in. Yeah. Oh, wow, look down here. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, what? how deep is that? 150 foot? Fucking hell. Gee, pardon? Sorry. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus. Wait, are you wanting to go to the bottom? Oh, I'm going to have you a look. You want to walk to the... Oh, Let's have a that look. That made me sweat, that did. Did it, you? Oh, it's dark. Have you got any lights? Have you got any torches? No. Oh, oh my God. I'm going to fall. Let's see if we can have a look. Dang. I ain't even seen the bottom yet, have you? No. Don't get your head stuck. Oh my god. <gasps> Why would they build this? I'm scared. I'm scared. Scared? Yeah, I'm scared. Of what? So what's that smell? Ghosts. Chris, sir. Chris, sir. There's no need to say that shit when we're going down the... I can't even see the steps anymore. Do you hear that ghost? Stop. Can we um, stick together? Come on, then. Well, you've got me holding this camera and I can't even see the steps. Have you not put a torch in the bag? No. You always do this. Come on. Come on. You've got bloody lights on. Do you? Why is it green? Come on. <laughs> Stop. Oh, we're at the bottom. Oh. <laughs> There's a big tunnel under here. I honestly thought we... What? There's a big tunnel. I thought we were going to be going down for years. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that smell was. Well, look up. You tell them that must have been built so they can get up to the fort. Yeah. It's just a staircase, isn't it? Hang on a minute. We just came up that staircase there, didn't we? Yeah. Well, there's another staircase here. Sorry? <laughs> Look, where does this staircase go? If that's the staircase there, where does this staircase go? How does that work? Is there two staircases? That's like mind blown, that is. <laughs> They're completely different steps as well. Chris, don't leave me. That's a completely different staircase. To where, though? There's two, one on top of each other. No way. Oh, you know why? There was two sets of steps at the top. That must be one up, one down. One way system. Yeah. Covid. <laughs> Are we going up this one, then? Oh, we'll go down that tunnel first, see where it comes out. Oh. Fuck it, now. As if two separate staircases, one on top of each other. I honestly, looking down from the top, thought we were going to be going down for ages. Because <laughs> I couldn't even see the bottom, could you? Why is this not just open? Huh? Guard house? Oh, can't get out of there, can you? No. Yeah. Huh. Another tunnel. Hello. Hello. Makes me sound like a choir singer. <laughs> uh -oh. I've got to go way back up now. Should we up the other staircase? I think we should. What about if we get all the way up in a slot, though? Yeah. That was a long way down. 
There you go, look. Three years to complete the shaft. Opened in 1809. 59 steps from the top of the bowl to the stairs. That felt like 559. Yeah, each, each spiral has 140 steps. So we're just on 280. Three staircases? What? Triple staircase? Triple? Okay, see. Oh, there is. There's one at the back and all. No way. Three staircases, one on top of each other. Bloody hell. What's this? Western Heights, the Grand Shaft. This is the first of the accommodation tunnels. This is where 185 soldiers and four officers sheltered during the frequent raids which were occurring here. Now, it's damp down here and it's dark down here. They did have lights, but they were very few and far between. So they did have lights, just one, two, three of them. One there, one there, and one down the end there. And they were for, they were coloured blue. And the reason that they were coloured blue was because that it was good for the soldiers' night sight, so they thought at that time. So what was happening was that uh, the soldiers were coming down here, gunners in particular, and they were sleeping down here, and they thought blue light would be most effective for them. When the alarms went, they could turn straight out and then go straight up to the guns and their lights wouldn't be affected. Now, in 1940, a war artist came here and he actually drew a picture or painted a picture of what life was like down here. So this is the picture that they had. On here, you can see that the soldiers have brought everything down with them. You can see the hue of the blue lights here as well, reflected on the white paintwork as it was at that time. The artist, whoever he was, he's made it look actually bigger than it really is, or taller than it really is. So there were bunks all the way up this side here, and all the way up that side there, with a walkway through the middle. They were one on top of the other. None of those bunks were allocated to actual soldiers, they just grabbed anyone that they want to. So that none of those things were actually personal to them. So therefore the bedding was never properly aired. So that got damp down here. As you can see, they brought everything with them. That's a boy's anti-tank rifle there. I haven't got a clue what that's doing down here. It should be locked away by right, but somebody decided it should be with him. So they put their uniforms up here to dry as well, which only made it even damper down here than it already was. The temperature that you're experiencing now, 12 degrees Celsius, is exactly the same summer and winter. It never changes, except it gets wetter down here in the summer. The warm air movement system here was not installed down here until, until 1942. So as you have it now, it's exactly as they experienced it then. So it's dark down here and it's damp down here. And it can get quite chilly as well. Therefore, a lot of people would think, oh, well, fair enough then. It can't get any worse than that, can it? Yes, it can. Out of the 184 soldiers down here and four officers, 184 soldiers and four officers were smokers. <laughs> now then, no, no. Smokers are human beings too, and they have their uses, especially when the lights go out, which they did almost every day. Now the generators which were supplying power to these sites here to the radar sites the air radio sites the shelters and what have you they were all ships engines they'd already spent a lifetime at sea now they were ashore providing electricity to gun sites and the accommodation buildings and things like that like all old things they were crotchety they were temperamental they only worked when they wanted to and also they were very um, subject to shock as well 
When we had these great big 18 inch shells from the SS gun battery blowing up over here, a huge area was an empty space, a great big radius of emptiness, nothing. It was a total vacuum. So if there was a near miss near one of the bunkers where the generators were, all the air would be drawn out of it. The engines, like human beings, need air. If they don't get it, then they stop. So they stopped, plunging the whole place into darkness. And that was when your smokers came into the equation. Most of the soldiers have got into the habit of carrying little pieces of candle around in their battle dress pockets. As soon as the light went out, the smokers would get their cigarette, uh, their lighters and their matches, light up their little bit of candle and stick it on the end of their bunks. And you can see it where it burnt into the cladding at various places right throughout the complex here. Now, I said about the 172nd Tunnelling Regiment being ex-coal miners. You can see why now. These are known as nine-foot mining rings. We call them colliery arches. But nine-foot mining rings is their official name. So, they and the cladding all came from a coal mine at Port Talbot in Wales. So that's why the soldiers only took 100 days to build these things, these places, because they were so used to the equipment and the other bits and pieces that they were using that it didn't take them long to do it all. So if you'd like to come this way. Now the soldiers, when this was installed, found a good use for the air conditioning ducting as well. So they started stowing their letters up there, their books up there, and their cigarettes up there. So when we started doing the survey down here, we found several letters up there, uh, interesting ones. We also found two books. One of them was uh, published in 1910. It was called The Shadow Over the Quarterdeck. It would never get published today. It was so politically incorrect, it was laughable. <clears throat> and we did have a good laugh out of it, actually. But uh, it was absolutely amazing, the type of things that they were reading. So 1910 was that book. We've kept it and we've had it refurbished too. Most of us have read it and it is interesting reading for the time. We found cigarette packets up here with cigarettes in them from companies we've never even heard of before. Once again, we put them to one side. Now, we did have them on display, but unfortunately, things started disappearing. Now, they did have water down here, but like everything else, it was rationed. It was in these 37 gallon drums at the end of every tunnel. It was for drinking purposes only. It was not for personal hygiene. So you're getting the idea now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, when they closed these places down in the mid-1950s, all they did was lock the doors, put a great big sign up on the door, keep out, and threw away the keys, leaving everything inside them, radar systems, radio systems, things like that. Now, when you tell a human being not to do something, what's the first thing they go and do? <laughs> they do it. So eventually they got in here. They got in through the World War I end, that end down there. Unlike this end, which is clad in steel, the, uh, the World War I part isn't. The parts that are clad are only clad in all railway sleepers which came off the railways at the end of the 19th century. So they were completely smothered in engine oil and coal dust and things like that. The youngsters that broke in here from St. Margaret's village set a fire and it burned very, very quickly because this stuff would catch fire, very combustible. In the fire and in the dark and in the smoke, they lost a young lady. She just wandered off into the dark and the smoke. Now, this was before the days of uh, mobile phones, plus the fact they didn't even know where they were. The fire brigade was eventually notified and they couldn't find the place because they didn't know where it was either. But eventually they arrived here, they set up and then they find they've lost a fireman. So now you've got two people wandering around in here in the dark and in the smoke. Eventually they do find them. So that was okay, that's all right. But the government had suddenly woken up to the fact that people can get into these places and they said, ah, now this is not good. We're going to have to do something about it. So what they decided to do was to take out as much as they could without anybody seeing what it is because there was secret stuff in uh, various other tunnels around here as well. 
and um, they didn't want the public to see that it had been left to rot away for 10 to 15 years. All that taxpayers' money, all lost, with the general election coming up, was not going to be a good vote catcher. So they ordered the scrap metal men to come down here and start trying to take stuff out. They also said to the scrap metal men, if you see anywhere like an exit or an entrance which is covered up, that the public might get down and see and think, ah, oh, there's something secret there, I want to know what it is, then just merely take a panel out or something like that or open it up completely so the public can see that there's nothing of interest. There's nothing secret for them to see anymore and they shouldn't be down here. So that's what the scrap metal men did. They removed this panel a little bit. So now you can see how they make these tunnels. The outer bore, the chalk bore, is bigger, obviously, than the inner bore, which is the metal one. Which means that in between there now, you've got an empty space. So what they do, they fill that empty space full of broken chalk to give it added insulation and also added strength. So now you're all experts on how to make tunnels, <laughs> which is more than the people who came in here were later, and that got them into trouble. So, what we're going to do, come in through here now. Now, this is another accommodation tunnel. We know that it's been used because you can see there where the cladding has been marked by people's candles from on the top bunks. This is also where the scrap metal men started their work. Now, are any of you here scrap metal men or women? Uh, no. No, no, you're not, no. not today anyway. Okay, scrap metal people, they see life a little bit differently from us. So, if we're out walking and we see a car, we see a car. They don't, they see money. So if we're out walking along the beach and we see a ship, we see a ship, they don't they see scrap. So naturally, if they come down here and they see a nine foot colliery arch, which is holding up the roof, that's not what they see, that's what we see. What they see is scrap. And so they cut it in half. And surprise, surprise, when the roof starts falling on their head, they all rush out of here shouting, cave in, and then we never saw them again. And they left some of their stuff behind. They left cutting gear, they left rocks and tackles, they left all sorts of stuff. They left an empty vodka bottle, a beer can, they left footwear, lots of coins, all sorts of strange things were left behind when they all did a runner out of here. So, this tunnel used to be exactly the same as this one before the scrap metal men got down here and might have made a right pig's ear of the whole thing. So now the government then decided that they were going to bring out an act called the Wartime ISO Eradication Act. And that's what they did do. It was to stop people getting down here. And what they said it was they were going to sabotage these tunnels. They couldn't do anything with them much because they're all bomb proof. So we thought, what do they mean by sabotage? We asked the Ministry of Defence about that and they said, we don't know. And um, so we just didn't know. We knew there were tunnels around here and then one day a man fell down one of them and it was reported to the National Trust whose land it had just been acquired and they said, that must be one of the tunnels. So they sent us along to have a look. So we arrived at this hole in the ground that the man had fallen down and um, that's where we were. All of this that you're in now is underneath there, but we didn't know that. All we had was this hole in the ground where the man fell down. And so I'm already down there. The reason I'm down there is I can tie knots. And so I was meant to be tying our stirrups for the other two to follow me down. This is the team leader. He's virtually standing on top of me because I can't move. And I'm shouting back at him, I can't move down here. There's a great big wall of chalk and it's all around me and I can't get round it and I can't get over the top of it. And that's when we thought, that's it. That's what they've done. They blocked up the stairways with chalk or something like that. And yes, that's exactly what they had done. 47 tons of chalk on the first stairway and 600 tons of chalk over the sound mirrors, which we didn't really know existed then. 
We thought they did, but they kept on telling us that they were gone. So anyway, that was it. So we all got out. Now, next day, as you do, you haven't got Tesco in Belgium yet, have you? Um, no, yeah. You haven't got Tesco in no, Belgium yet, have you? No. no. no you will. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're taking over the world, apparently. <laughs> so next day, I went shopping in Tesco's, as you do. And I was talking to the Tesco checkout lady, and she said, you went whizzing past me the other day and didn't even say hello. You were in a hurry going somewhere. And I said, I wasn't. I was coming back from somewhere. And she said, oh, crikey, well, you're still in a hurry. I said, I've just been to those new tunnels that the National Trust has just bought. And she said, oh, that's interesting. Where are they? So I said, Fan Bay. And she said, well, I never. You don't know this, but on the day I was born in 1967, my father was down there fighting a fire. And in that fire, he lost one of his firemen. So I said, oh, that's careless. And she said, oh, no, they found him again. It's OK, it's all right. But you know what my dad is like? He's such the ultra professional. And he took it very much to heart. That was when he decided he was going to map every single tunnel from Folkestone to Ramsgate. That's 60 plus tunnels. So I said, wow, any chance that we could go and see your dad? And she said, yes, if you want to, we'll go and see him Tuesday. So myself and the team leader went to see this chap, very nice guy called John Walton. And sure enough, he produced his plans of the tunnels and they were exceptional, just what I would expect from a man of his calibre. And we were chatting away and I said, any chance we could borrow one of these, John? Because if we get down into those tunnels, we want to be able to find our way safely around. And he said, yeah, that's all right. Anyway, we, he gave us one and we were just walking out of his bungalow. And he said, hang on a minute, lads, I've just remembered something. I got the originals. I found them in a rubbish skip at Folkestone Barracks. And he had. And he produced the one which is for here. There it is. It's just become a young man and young lady here. So this is a copy of the original builder's plan for these tunnels. And it's what we use to find our way around down here because we all make copies of it. On here is everything we need to know. There's the stairways coming down where we've been. We've been along here. We're just standing by there now, about to go into the emergency storeroom, which leads into the emergency hospital, which isn't. So everything we needed down here, the orientation, the lengths of the tunnels, also the heights of the steps where the fuse panels were, everything is there, is there. And so that was great. That's what we used to find our way safely around. And of course, it proves that once again, you can get almost anything from Tesco's. Mm -hmm. So we are now just by here. In the st There's the storeroom. When we got here, it had a door on it. And this door had two locks. And I thought, that's strange. I've never seen a door like that before. And I had three other people with me, and I'm standing trying to puzzle out this door. And in my mind came sabotage. And I thought, ah, I wonder if this door is sabotaged. And so the other three said, ooh, could be. And so I'm trying to work out how I can sensibly do it without anything happening. And I'm suddenly aware that their gossip had moved a little bit further away from me and gone quieter. And when I turned around, they're right down there. So I said, what are you doing down there? And they said, well, we're not going to stand by you in case you blow up. <laughs> and I thought, that's nice. You soon find out who your friends are, don't you? So I leant against the door and the door fell off. And so I ended up in here and the door, nothing was sabotaged. It was just the door was 75 years old. So we took out the keys and we get into here. So we'd like to come in. Uh, this was, according to the pan, plan, the emergency storeroom. We did find stuff in here. We found gas masks, we found footwear, we found um, camouflage netting. Once again, loads of coins and things like that. But what was most important to us was what we found hiding up here. It was a World War II, 1943 football pools coupon. And there it is there. So the football pools way back in the 1940s, as you possibly might be aware, it was a sort of a lottery type thing, except it involved your favorite football teams. You would pick those you thought would draw, and if they drew and you got 21 of them, that would be great. And you won lots and lots of money. This soldier in October 1943 filled out this football pools coupon. And then for some reason, he hid it 
up there. <laughs> he filled out this football pool's coupon on the day that this place received its heaviest ever bombing raid and shelling raid all together, both at the same time. It was a five hour raid, and in that raid, a lot of people were killed around here. But from this gun site, two people were killed. A gunner called Harold Aram and uh, the Naffy cook, Edith Burrow, from St. Margaret's. A lot of people were wounded. So what we think is, he was one of the wounded. And he'd hidden it down here because he was being treated next door in the emergency hospital. So that's what we believe possibly happened. We don't know who he was, unfortunately, because he didn't fill that bit in, but he did fill the rest of it in. Doesn't matter, really, because he knew nothing about football. All his teams were rubbish. <laughs> These are the two keys we took out the door. They're not that big, actually. They're only about that big. But we just put them there so you get a comparison with the size of it. So it's quite likely that the guy was treated next door. Now, this is one of the two compartments which has been specially praised, uh, sprayed by cork insulation to keep it drier and also to give it some warmth as well, just like in next door. So if you'd like to come in here, this was the emergency hospital. According to the plans, it did have six beds in here. It did have a medical locker with medical instruments in one corner, and it did have a drug cabinet, apparently locked up with some drugs in it. But this site, which is unusual for a gun site, did not qualify for a doctor or for a surgeon. All he had was a little gunner who could do first aid. He could slap plasters onto people and he could put bandages onto people. But that was the sum total of his medical ability. And here he is at a gun site where you're always getting people getting injured by the nature of the job. Plus the fact that this gun site has three stairways which when wet are slippery. So there is also a constant source of people with sprained ankles and fractured wrists, all for this little gunner to look after. Then came the day of the big raid. Now he's really got his work cut out because they left the dead up there, but they brought the wounded down here. So this little gunner who could do first aid suddenly find himself having to look after people who are severely injured. He's trying to put them back together again and try and reassure them. He must have been working like a one-armed paper hanger, trying to give them some comfort and things like that. And he must have thought himself at one stage, oh, crikey, when's this going to end? Three hours? He's got another two hours to go yet. He doesn't know it yet. And then, according to the diary, the lights went out. So now he's really got a problem because by 1943, many soldiers, sailor, airmen, marines were suffering what today we call post-traumatic stress disorder. But in those bad old days, it was called LMF, lack of moral fiber, cowardice, basically. And if you displayed any of the signs, then they used to take you out of the circuit and court-martial you, imprison you, or give you hard labor for the next couple of years. It didn't matter whether you're an officer or whether you were a private. The same applied to everybody. The most famous case which we researched was the sailor who escaped from a sinking submarine off Malta. He was the only survivor to get out of his submarine. And they got him ashore, they sent him back to Britain, they fixed him. And then the powers to be said, okay, you're all right now, you're going back into boats. And he said, no, I'm not. And they said, yes, you are, you're going back into boats. He said, I'm not going back into boats, no way. I just got out of one of them. And they said, okay, fair enough, you have the consequences. And that night he disappeared. He wasn't seen again by anybody in authority until 1954, when they found him hiding underneath the theatre floor in the Royal Naval Barracks at Devonport. Everybody in the Royal Navy, from admirals down to sailor stokers, knew he was there, and not one person said a word about him until the Daily Mail newspaper found out about it. He'd been getting his food, he'd been getting money, he'd been even getting his tot of rum, and he was quite happy living under the floor of the theatre. It was nice there, he didn't have to be in a submarine. And so that was how it all came to light. That was when the forces took a great big change and thought, 
this is it, this is wrong, we mustn't keep on doing this LMF thing. It would be in green letters on your discharge document, which meant that as soon as you produce that to a would-be employer, he would turn around and say, nope, you're a coward, we're not going to employ you. So that followed the, that stigma followed you around for the rest of your life. Cruel, horrible thing to do. But anyway, that's when I'm glad to say now we've started learning a lot more about the seriousness of PTSD. Okay, now also, it's anyway, it's frightening for anybody that was down here, including the civilians, if you've never experienced total blackness before. So have you all experienced total darkness? Total darkness, that is, yes? That's okay then. We will do it then. <laughs> so we're gonna go out this way now, if you'd like to follow me. These are what we call the drift tunnels. They're the unsheathed tunnels. So some of them have been dug out by hand during the World War I as well. But if you look above the arch here, you can see what good tunneling procedure is all about. You see how they put all the chalks, big lumps of chalk up there, to give it some strength and add an insulation as well. So that's what's there. Now, this long line here, is known as the Seaford Fault. It's a flint line and of great historical value, but I'll be telling you more about that when we go deeper inside. You start seeing some of the first of the graffiti here as well. It's white on white, so it's a bit difficult to see initially, but if you look behind the lady and the gentleman here, you can see a gunner. There he is, in 1940. He's telling you, look at me, I'm a gunner, and I'm here in 1940. Gunners are noisy people, they really are. And so this is what he's doing. He's actually shouting at you out of this wall, saying, I'm a gunner. And nearly all the gunners who have put graffiti up have done it in the same manner. Just behind here is what we think is the unit insignia for the 172nd Tunneling Division. That it has been vandalized. We think it was vandalized by the 238th Pioneer Corps who then had theirs vandalised by the 172nd Tunneling Division. So there's a lot of inter-unit rivalry going on here. Then there's a somewhat poignant one here. There he is, T. Smith, from the 1st Queen's Regiment. Now we believe that he could have been one of those that was being hidden here, because the 1st Queen's Regiment was wiped out just outside Dunkirk. There were 30 survivors from the entire regiment, which was based at Canterbury. They never reformed the 1st Queen's Regiment, ever. But he still thinks he's in it. So it's quite possible that he was one of those that was being kept out of the way of authority. So this is an airlock here. Now airlocks were used to separate the accommodation areas from the working areas. They had great big steel doors on them. And um, the idea was, if you all had to come in, you open up the steel door and you all trot in. Then um, they slam all the doors shut and you hang around in here then for a couple of minutes just putting some graffiti on the wall like that one there, AC, and then this one here from 1940, 41 I think, something like that, JG from 1941. And then as soon as they think that the pressure's right and the temperature's right, they open up the other door and they all fall out into a new world. So if you come this way. Now, there's a lot more graffiti up here on the walls and there's another gunner down there as well. Gunner Ward, as you can see, you know, Gunner Wood, it's in great big letters, just proclaiming to the world that he's here. But what really interests us about here actually is the fact that we're standing in 60 to 80 million years of history and we know that for a fact because if you look on the ceiling here if you'd like to come a little closer and look up there you can see a great big fossil can you see it mm. another one by there well that's a fish's fin here actually this one here is a snowshoe clam they disappeared 60 million years ago so we know that's 60 million years anyway so, do you know what the composition of chalk is? You can touch it a little bit if you want. It's coccoliths, as we call them. That is trillions upon trillions upon trillions of broken shells and fish bones that have fallen down and have been compounded and compounded down on the seabed 
for millions and millions of years and it carries on doing that as well. So it's compounding all the time and then it creates this semi-solid substance called chalk which is porous, so that's that. Then if you look around you, there is the Seaford flint line. This is a plateau and it, it extends across here, it extends into France and then France into Belgium, Belgium into Holland, Holland into Germany, Germany into Denmark to the northeast and to the southwest as far as Kazakhstan. So this is a huge plateau and it proves that 80 million years ago that we were all linked together as one great big unit. So all of Europe all together in one great big heap. Now then, um, just behind me we've got some more flint here, but these are random bits and pieces. You can see another one there. Now flint, if you touch it, is, is hard and it's sharp as well. It's hard to believe that in another time, 50, 60 billion years ago, that was a sponge. And what had happened apparently was the sponge had been out for a night out and he'd come out the nightclub and he was sponging his way back home again and then he had a heart attack and he died. And he fell down onto the seabed, which was still solvent at that time, and then trillions upon trillions upon trillions of coccolis, fish bones, broken um, fish bones. Then we've got lots of other bits of graffiti here, CJCO from 1943 and then Lindsay from 1941. Now we thought that was a bit strange, a name Lindsay, until we started looking around through the diaries and what have you and we found her. It was a girl, a young girl. We had 24 German, French and English speaking girls out of the Navy and the Air Force. They come straight out of convent school and or from uh, private schools, all fluent in different languages. And they were carrying out the first element of electronic warfare from here, which is called spoofing. That was the passing of erroneous information. And they got away with it for three years until the big raid, because that's what the Germans were after. They'd actually woken up to the fact that all the misinformation that was coming from here, being fed to the pilots of aircraft landing on the French airfields, was coming from this place here. And uh, it took them a long time to work it out. It's only when they got their new equipment and they did a direction finder fix on her that they realized it was here. So that was what the big raid was all about. Okay, out we go. Right, um, I hear you ask me where are the toilets when well, you're standing in them. <laughs> this is it, two cubicles for four officers and the other 185 soldiers had equally luxurious surroundings further down. This is one of our two sound mirrors. This one is angled slightly upwards to give us air early warning. The other one's angled slightly downwards to give us surface early warning. We used to get lots of fog once upon a time and that's when the enemy used to try and creep up on us in the fog. Now what we had here operating these mirrors was a highly trained soldier because these were the precursors to radar. Radar is an electronic aid to early warning and navigation. This is an audio one. So there's our highly trained soldier. He has been trained to listen out for different types of engines. Different types of engines mean different type of platforms. Different types of revolution count mean different types of mischief. So he's plugged into a sound collector pointing to the center of the disc and through just an ordinary medical stethoscope basically. And there he is listening away. That's his assistant pretending to be a stepladder. So he would be here and the essence of this was that they could also take bearings because there was another one of these at Cable Le Fern further over towards Folkestone and another one at Sheppey. So if he heard something like an, an aircraft engine, he would take a bearing of it. Then they would phone up Cable Le Fern and then they would phone up Sheppey. And you would get what we call triangulation marks then, a fix 
there's one bearing there, there's one bearing there, there's another bearing there. Where all three of those bearings cross is the position of the threat at that time. If you do the same thing again, six minutes later, which is a tenth of an hour, you will then get a track line so you can see which way they're going and work out then how fast they're going along that track line. So if it was going that way, you'd phone up CNC Portsmouth and tell him that there's a threat coming towards you down there. If he's going that way, you phone up the Admiralty in London and say that there's a threat coming towards London. But if it was a surface ship or a submarine on the surface, it was pretty obvious they were there because you could hear these diesel engines. That was the other mirror and they were very successful using it for exactly that because all they did was test pass the bear into the duty destroyer in Dover. He would come out because he knew if he went into the general area where they were and they were still doing a battery charge, he would get a good chance of depth charging them. Otherwise, all they did was sit there for six hours until the air or the electricity ran out in the submarine and they were forced to service if they could. On the Admiralty charts there's loads and loads of wrecks marked around here and many of them, at least half a dozen of them at least, are ex-submarines as well that were caught trying to get in towards the harbour. So these were all obsolete by 1922 and then radar took over and the cell mirror operators, he was unfortunately the only weak link because it did work, but he could only do approximately an hour at a time, maybe, on the mirrors. Because if he got distracted, then that was it, totally finished for him. So he'd be concentrating hard, concentrating hard, and then in the middle of that would come the little train that delivered all the uh, kerosene and the paraffin, or then the coalman with his horse and cart delivering the coal. That would completely destroy his concentration. So he'd have to go inside, sit down on a bench in the dark, and then when he, they thought he was ready after an hour or so, they'd let him back out again. So that's why he got paid extra money. And that's what annoyed the other soldiers. Mm -hmm. right, So this is where the cell mirror operators had their benches just inside here and also in the next bit as well. And obviously they got bored while they were here because they started playing knots and crosses or tic-tac-toe as the Americans call it on the wall there and it's probably with their bayonets as well because you can see where they were sharpening in the mud. So nobody won that game there, somebody won that one down there. Right, this way. Now this is a rather city accommodation tunnel. That's a date one, yeah. <clears throat> And it's the one that was most favoured actually because it has two exits and two entrances. So there's various graffiti down here from all to over the times actually, from the last uh, 80 odd years. Uh, some recent ones that we can't make head and tail out of um, four of them there actually from the 1970s who did work to all sorts of mischief by the look of it. Uh, right ho, so the officer's accommodation was just up by here. It had no yep. rooms, no extra luxuries, it was just six beds in there for the four officers, and that was about it. And that was their lot. This we found in the bushes up, uh, just up top. Uh, an Israeli artillery officer dated it for us. He reckons it's from, from the First World War, from a German destroyer with a 5.5 inch gun. And that's an armor pierced shell. So somebody shot at us, but it didn't do much damage. Although it would have hit you on the head, you would have got a headache, I expect, if that would hit you. Uh, right. So just before we go back up, just introduce you to the rock. Now, this is rock. If anything went wrong down here, it always happened on a Saturday afternoon. 
And one Saturday afternoon, I was working right down the far end all by myself. And I heard a rumbling noise and then a bang. And I thought, oh no, what's happened this time? And then a voice called out, is everybody okay? Nobody injured? Nobody been squashed? And I thought, squashed? Oh, that's a deal. We haven't had that one before. <laughs> and then the voice said, okay, everybody come down this end. Let's have a head count. So we all sauntered down here. And right by there, there you see the mark it made there, with all the dust still coming, settling from it, it was the rock. And it just come down the stairs, where two of the people had been working. Those two people were up against the wall, just by here, absolutely petrified. And as I got by here, I looked straight at the one on the left. And I thought, what the heck happened? Because all I could see was great big white eyes looking at me. And all his hair was all sticking up from underneath his helmet. So I thought, boy, oh, you've had a fright. And as I went to go towards him, he said, I've never seen anything like it before. It was just like a Harrison Ford movie. There was this great big rock and it was rolling down the stairs and I can't get out the way. <laughs> I thought, no wonder you were frightened then. So anyway, there it was. They disappeared actually, those two, we never saw them again. We're all standing around the rock just like this and the team leader said to us, okay boys, is everybody okay? And we said, yeah. And he said, right. Let's put it back again. <laughs> and that's why it's still here. <laughs> and that's why he learned some new swear words that Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm.